Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the uh, Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia, and this is our COVID-19 report for June 9th. Um, I'm very grateful to be speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Lokongan-speaking peoples of the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and we're very happy that we can have these, um, these important updates on these uh, traditional lands. So today we have uh, nine new people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and one additional epidemiologically linked case, bringing our total new cases to 10 in the province and our total to 2,669 people in BC with COVID-19. Um, that includes 908 pe people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,370 people in the Fraser Health Region, 130 people in the Vancouver Island Health Region, 195 people in Interior Health Region, and 66 people in the Northern Health Region. There are no new healthcare outbreaks. We continue to have four active outbreaks in our healthcare system in long-term care. And we've uh, also gone a day with no new cases in our long-term care. So we continue to have 340 residents of long-term care who've been affected and 218 staff. We have no new community outbreaks and we continue to monitor and support at the six remaining outbreaks that we are managing. Um, so that leaves us with 183 active cases across the province, of whom 16 are hospitalized, four of whom are in critical care or ICU. And another day, a very positive note, we have had no new deaths in the last 24 hours. So that leaves us uh, 2,319 people who are now fully recovered from COVID-19 in BC. I'm very grateful that in recent weeks, our numbers of new cases here in British Columbia continue to trend down and to be low. We have had, as we are aware, a number of small community outbreaks, but we are at that point where we are, are able to find these quickly. And that speaks to the work that we are all doing to follow the, the safe distancing rules, but also to stay away from others and to get tested if we get sick. But I want everyone to understand that the COVID-19 pandemic around us is far from over. In British Columbia, we continue to have small numbers of cases, but across Canada and around the world, it is still a major problem and is going to be in our communities around the world for some time now. The global case count continues to rise and many regions are facing a resurgence in cases as they've um, taken measures to open up, including regions that are very close to us in the United States. And just yesterday was the highest single day for new cases globally since this pandemic started with over 136,000 people being affected. And we know that there are new regions of the, of the world that are being affected. And when, um, when this is in one country, we are all connected. We know from, from several months ago that it matters to us when something like this happens in China. It matters to us when something happens in Italy, in Spain. It matters to us when it happens in the United States and here in Canada. And now we're looking at the challenges that are being faced by countries such as India and Brazil. It recognizes no borders and it recognizes none of our geopolitical barriers that we put in place. Very early this morning, I was on a, a, a call talking with my colleagues around the world with the WHO, looking at how we are managing these cases and how we are supporting each other, how we're doing public health activities, what are the things that worked, how can we become more efficient and more effective at case management, at contact tracing, and we're learning from each other and we'll be having a series of these over the, last, uh, over the next two days. But here in Canada, we know that international flights are increasing and U.S. border restrictions are going to be eased to allow for families who have been separated for these last few months to be, to be able to reunite. These changes are not unexpected and they are important in helping us get our social fabric back together. We also know that many businesses and schools here in BC and across the country have reopened. So our goal needs to be to learn to live safely with this virus, to protect ourselves as much as possible as we do that. 
To do this, we need to be watching closely what is happening globally, what is happening in our own continent, and what is happening here in the province. And we need to take our measures that we have learned that we continue to need to protect our communities, our families, and our province. And our path forward is to minimize, manage, and modify as we need. And that means we need, all need to continue to take the actions that we have been doing to minimize our numbers of close contacts and reduce the numbers of cases that we see in our community. We need to manage those clusters and outbreaks with rapid contact tracing, with making sure that we in public health have the resources to stop outbreaks from expanding rapidly. And we need to modify the measures we are all following as we need to, given the situation that we're facing here in BC. What all of us can do today and every day is to continue to assess our own risks, our own risks in our family, our risks in our small communities, particularly if we're going back to school, particularly if we have people who are more vulnerable to getting severe disease, particularly if we have loved ones who are in settings like care homes. We need to take precautions to protect ourselves and those around us, whether we're at work, at home, whether we're traveling, whether that is essential travel that we're doing as part of our work, or whether it is um, being with our family over the summer and going to, to communities or traveling within BC. We need to continue without exception to stay away from others, stay home if we are feeling unwell. And anywhere in BC, you can get tested if you have symptoms that are related to COVID-19. And no matter where you are, we need to continue to follow our rules for safe social interactions. So that smaller numbers, bigger spaces, safe distances, washing our hands regularly, cleaning our environment, and the added layer of wearing a, a mask if we're in those situations where we might not be able to maintain our safe distances. We've said all along that we are experiencing our pandemic here in BC and nation to nation, province to province, state to state, our circumstances are unique. But our efforts to keep our loved ones and our communities safe are shared amongst us all. We can protect our families, our communities and our province by protecting each other and doing this by being thoughtful and understanding in our words and in our actions and continuing to do it as we have been doing it here in BC by being kind to each other, by being calm and by staying safe. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the star one to enter the queue, you are limited to one question. I would also ask you, please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good day, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking the question. A uh, statement from you and Health Minister Dix last Wednesday urged the organizers of peaceful protests to, quote, follow the provincial health officer's order to limit gatherings to no more than 50 people. Are you disappointed that that order wasn't respected, and do you know why it wasn't enforced? Yeah, so we have always taken the approach of support and education for all of our orders, and this is no different. Um, I am disappointed because I know there are very effective ways for small groups of people to demonstrate these important issues and to do it peacefully and to do it safely. And I encourage people to find those ways. Um, there's lots of, of examples of them around the world and, and here at home. So smaller groups, keeping a distance from each other, you know, these are the things that we need to do to protect our communities. And I was talking about that today, talking about it with colleagues around the world. And, you know, my colleagues in, in some states in the U.S. are very concerned that the, the protests that are happening down there, particularly when there's attempts to shut them down and there's use of things like... Uh, um, and like tear gas to disperse crowds, you know, those are things that can provide an environment that would uh, um, allow this virus to transmit. And we are starting to see increases in some states that are very worrisome. We have not yet seen anything like that here in Canada, but certainly not in BC. Um, but we are watching carefully, and I will say again, you know, find small, um, impactful ways where you can stay separate from each other, where you can um, have your voice heard in a way that's safe 
particularly for those people who are more likely to be disadvantaged by, um, by this pandemic. And that includes some of the people for whom we are standing up and having our voices heard. Next question is from Mary Griffin, Czech News. Oh, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call, Dr. Henry. Um, I've just been looking at a long-term care facility here in Victoria, Mount St. Mary's, which um, as of today, they've, uh, sorry, yesterday, they updated their protocol that now allows family members who meet their um, guidelines to go in to see some of their family members for the first time in three months. But um, it, it just seems that... Um, uh, th this information about that there there is a loosening on restrictions for family members is not very well known or circulated. And the seniors advocate um, indicated that the guidelines were um, uh, loosened at the end of May on uh, who can go in to the facilities. And I just think some family members would be interested in knowing that they may be able to see their loved ones coming up soon, particularly here on the island where we haven't had a new case in weeks. So I, I would be cautious. We've always said that there are some essential family members who need to provide care to people in long-term care, and that has been decided on a local basis um, by uh, the, the regional health authority, the MHOs. We will have a provincial policy for general visiting with the appropriate caveats in place to protect that community and to protect the workers and to protect the people coming in. As you know, many people who visit uh, a loved loved one in long-term care are, are potentially at risk themselves, either because of age or because of, of issues of health. And that will be coming on a provincial basis, and we will be doing this in a coordinated way that supports all families and all long-term care homes. So I think that is important to know. And we, we have to be careful not to become complacent. We know people move. This virus is spread by people giving it to others, most often the people that we are close to. And we need to be able to be sure that we're not going to introduce it in an environment where others will be at risk. And we, uh, we have not seen a case, thankfully, on Vancouver Island for some time. But that doesn't mean that we are free of risk because we know there needs to be movement back and forth to this island to support essential services for a variety of reasons. And that, as I mentioned, you know, when there's virus anywhere, there's virus risk everywhere. Ethan Sawyer, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, yesterday, you mentioned a cluster of cases in the Fraser Health region associated with a family gathering. Uh, as more of us consider expanding our bubbles, it might be helpful to know a few more details about that event, such as how many people attended, was it held outside or inside, um, and how many people tested positive for COVID-19 after attending. Yes, so I can't tell you all of the details, but I know it was a family gathering that was a combination of inside and outside, um, and that there was approximately 30 people, and at least 15 of them have tested positive. So that is a warning sign to us all. And it's not that somebody intentionally brings that into the, their community, to their loved ones, to their family. This is something that we have been seeing uh, around the world, that that is one of the most common ways it gets transmitted. It's the people that we are closest to and spend time with. So these are the things that we've been talking about, about the importance of, um, you know, outside, but still maintaining distance, not sharing food in terms of having buffets, because that's a way where we um, pass things on to each other potentially. You know, but the most important thing is the time that we spend in close uh, proximity to somebody within that um, one to two meter radius. And even if it is outside, if you're spending time in close contact talking to somebody, it is still risky. And that, of course, is our concern right now. So um, we go back to the basics that we need to remember. Maintaining our safe distances, keeping our bubbles small right now. And this will be something that we'll need to continue so that we don't get these explosive outbreaks that can potentially happen. 
We know that people in our, in our homes and people in our families, uh, many of them are essential workers, whether it's healthcare workers, whether they're truckers coming back from the U.S. with essential goods, whether they're people um, uh, back and forth to Alberta, for example. So there are many reasons why people need to travel, and we need to be aware of, uh, of the risks in our communities and the risks in our family. And it is why I've been so fussed about, um, about the, the limits on gatherings, because we know those are environments where we inadvertently spread it to the people that we are closest to. Richard Zussman, Global News. Dr. Henry, WorkSafe BC, oh, thank you for taking the question. Um, WorkSafe BC has issued some guidelines around uh, television and film. Uh, do you have an expectation of when we could potentially start seeing that sector back up? And is there anything that stands out for you as concerning about uh, the operation of the television and film sector in British Columbia? Yeah, so I actually haven't seen the details yet of those uh, the guidance. I know they were working on them. Um, that is a plan for our next phase, so phase three, where we were not there yet. We're still in our second incubation period. But, you know, as we see, the numbers are looking relatively good. So that's a possibility. We still, however, have challenges with, uh, we are not uh, having um, uh, non-essential workers or family reunification is the uh, restrictions we have on our borders right now. So that is a, an area that will need to be addressed. Um, as well, we need to consider uh, where people are coming from. So if there are people coming from a variety of places um, into our uh, into our province, whether it's from the U.S. or from uh, countries in Europe or, or China, um, they bring their risk with them. So we need to ensure that we continue. And right now, there's still a quarantine order federally, and there's a provincial order that people need to, to self-isolate for 14 days after coming. So all of those provisions need to be taken into account as well. Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Dr. Henry, I was hoping to ask you today a little bit more about what you just talked about with the film industry, but um, other industries like restaurants, theaters, and businesses that depend on numbers being higher to survive, will there come a time that large facilities with enough space to accommodate the two-meter distance rule will be allowed to have more than 50 people? Uh, you, you know, those are things that we're looking at. And uh, currently, right now, there are provisions for some restaurants, depending on, on their, their size, that it, it, they have. Right now, the restriction is on 50% of occupancy, um, plus the distancing and the small numbers of people. So the, the whole um, idea behind this is looking at risk. And every time that we um, allow more people to be in a closed space together in particular, allow more people to, to have those important visits in long-term care homes, we are running the risk of more cases and more outbreaks. And so it becomes a balancing of that. It's not about trying to punish businesses or, or it's trying to find ways that we can safely enjoy those businesses, enjoy restaurants, safely uh, go to retail stores, safely visit our loved ones in care homes um, as best we possibly can. But we must uh, recognize that every time we do that, there is a potential risk of transmission. Even, um, even though we have low numbers that we found here in BC, that doesn't mean that uh, we're, we're out of danger with that. So we will be continuously reviewing these things and we've been looking at, um, as I've said when we started this, you know, we, we're making it up in a sense as we go based on, on best evidence that we have from around the world and what others are doing and how it's working and, you know, these early morning calls that I had with my colleagues around the world is, is ways that we help exchange information and understand what are the things that make a difference. So we will be absolutely revisiting um, the guidance around rest Restaurants. We'll be revisiting all of the guidance that we have. Um, we're uh, doing a, um, a review nationally about uh, numbers in terms of mass gatherings and is there, is there a cutoff that uh, has some science behind it now, now that we've seen what's happened in other countries. But then if I, you know, we go back to um, where we need to stay the course, we will not be changing the fact that we need to maintain those safe distances. We need to maintain the high hand hygiene. We need to be fastidious about staying away from any place if we're feeling unwell. We won't be changing those, and we won't be changing those anywhere in the world in the near term. Um, 
And I've told some stories, um, some of them that are events that happened here, but you know, very recently in Germany, there was a, a, a church gathering where they were supposedly um, maintaining their safe distances and 107 of the congregants um, became ill and three people died. So, you know, these are the things that we're learning from, um, that there are certain things that we do in, in, a, in a faith-based setting where um, singing and uh, singing together, chanting, can increase our risk of spreading this over larger distances. So we need to be mindful of those concerns as we move forward. But for now, um, we will be absolutely reviewing things as we go. And Bob Mackin, Breaker News. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, you talked yesterday about consistency in doing things and reducing chains of contact, but uh, thousands of people, as you've seen across Canada, are not following the orders against mass gatherings. The, the Prime Minister attended one, and here in BC, the MP for Richmond Centre and a Vice President of the VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation were in a group that stood shoulder to shoulder with no masks for a photo op. I, I don't see much resistance from public health authorities to this. Or are you content to let this happen so as to eventually achieve herd immunity? <laughs> yeah, n no. Uh, our aim is not to achieve herd immunity through infecting people. We've seen that that can be um, deadly to young people as well as to those who are more vulnerable, more at risk. Um, I can only say that our approach in BC has always been to support to educate, to make sure people have the means to do what they need to do and to do know what they need to do and ask them to do that and to remind people of the importance of it. And I continue to do that and I would continue to talk to leaders in our communities about the best ways that we can fight um, the, the important causes like anti-racism causes in a way that does not add to any risk in our communities. Next question is from Lisa Cordesco, CHLY. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Henry. If I understand it correctly, there never has been a provincial health order banning film uh, production or really visits to care homes. These are just policies individually taken on. So in reality, those sectors can resume activities without your approval. Am I correct? Uh, not entirely, no. We have had an order around uh, um, both local orders and provincial orders around protection of long-term care homes and part of that is restriction on visitors. So that is. As well, we've had uh, uh, restrictions on essential uh, working um, but uh, it's, a, it's a slightly grey area in terms of uh, things like um, TV and film production, but that has been under our direction. Um, not, uh, it's a too risky a venture for the way it was in the past, and they need to come up with uh, ways of doing it that meet the criteria that we have in place to protect people. And the other part, of course, of the film industry is there are restrictions that are law, if you will, around um, international travel, around people coming into um, BC and to Canada, and there's requirements around quarantine that need to be put in place uh, around those as well. Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, there have been increasing calls for disaggregated data um, as it pertains to racialized communities and how they are impacted by COVID-19. I know you've talked about this before. I'm just wondering if you can just let us know where BC is at and how you respond to critics who say that it's a disservice uh, not to have that information. Uh, we absolutely agree with that, and that's why we have been putting in place a number of things. So when we initially started collecting information, case information on this virus, our case report, report forms did not include uh, race-based information or disaggregated information by race or ethnicity um, or social economic status or job in, in many cases. So uh, that is something that is important and we recognize that. We have from the very beginning uh, collected information on indigeneity and we continue to do that in partnership with Métis Nation BC and the First Nations Health Authority and that has been really important in helping us understand the impact in those communities. But we have two initiatives that I mentioned yesterday but we'll talk about again. One is the, the survey that we did that we had started planning for this from very early on and that is understanding the impact that both COVID has had and the measures we've put in place 
because we know both of those have differential impacts on different communities. And we are collecting some very important disaggregated information by race, by ethnicity, by community, um, by socioeconomic status, because that does help us understand um, the impacts that it's had on, on various different communities across the province. In addition, we are doing an, a, a, a lot of work, actually, um, with uh, my team, with the BCCDC, uh, looking at what we're calling the unintended consequences, both positive and negative, because we want to be able to highlight going forward what are the positive things that we can do more of and what are the negative things that we need to address and who is differentially affected by those. So we are doing that. And in addition, we're looking at proxies for certain communities by being able to report at a smaller geographic level. And we talked a little bit about that last week, and we'll be d presenting um, data at a, at a smaller level to get a better understanding of that in the coming days as well. Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, the closure of the Canada-U.S. border is set to expire on June 21st. Reuters news agency today is reporting both governments have agreed to extend that until at least late July. Just like what your take is on that, I assume that's something you would support. And given what's going on in the states right now, um, with 14 states reporting uh, record high seven-day uh, averages of, of COVID-19 cases, what's, when you talk to your counterparts in the United States in public health, what are they telling you? What, what's going on there? Are they asking you for advice, given how well we're doing here? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, we are very concerned, obviously, about the border. I think it's important, I've said this before, about family reunification and making sure we're, we're putting provisions in place that allow families to come together again. And uh, I'm, that has started as of, I guess, midnight tonight. So uh, we'll see. What is important about our borders and what we see from our data is, and the genomic epidemiology we presented last week, is that we need to be able to manage people who come across our borders, whether there's international from, um, from um, Brazil or from Europe or from China or from the United States. And we will continue to do that and work with our federal counterparts on that. Um, so I wasn't aware of uh, the extension yet, but I think we need to be very cautious about um, allowing people who are here as tourists coming across the border. And I think that's the last thing we need right now. We need to focus on, on families. We need to focus on essential workers and being able to support them. And in terms of talking with my colleagues across the, uh, the U.S., um, I talk regularly with my colleagues in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Um, we have weekly calls, um, and we all exchange information, and we're learning from each other. And it has been very concerning. Uh, Washington State, Oregon, and Alaska are starting to see upticks. Um, more concerning is some of the states where uh, they have had uh, early openings, and I th I'm thinking about the states like uh, Georgia, where uh, they've had a dramatic increase, and their numbers are as high as they were when they put their lockdown measures in place in March. And it is concerning. Part of that is related to increased testing, and so that is what we're seeing in, uh, in a number of uh, states as well. But uh, much of it is a true increase. Although, um, particularly, uh, you know, my colleagues in Washington State are dealing with some of the same things we are in terms of outbreaks in uh, food processing facilities. So the, the numbers I have a better idea of, they are getting a handle, as we are, thankfully, on some of the issues around our long-term care homes. Um, and the, the population that's affected in, in states like Georgia and Arizona um, is a new population. They're not seeing as many hospitalizations but it may just be that that's a, a, what we call a lag indicator. It may be some time before that uh, shows up. I, I will say as well, I mean, one of the biggest concerning areas in the United States is, uh, is some of the American Indian communities, uh, both the, the Navajo and the Hopi Nation in, in Arizona. And I know they're um, spending a lot of time trying to support those uh, communities. Um, we are learning a lot about this virus as we go, and uh, discussions with my colleagues around the world, you know, there's still much we don't know, um, and I know there's been a bit of controversy about how much is spread asymptomatically, etc., but um, we are learning a lot about what are the things that, that work to help manage it, and there's been some great studies that have come out that sh have shown that um, the distancing that we've put in place does work. It saves lives. 
And those are the things that we're trying to titrate and, and um, put in place in ways that are, are more strategic so that we don't have to go back to some of those broad stroke measures that we took in March. And we have lots of discussions about trying to support each other in doing that. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later today. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Lisa Usda, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry. I know you've mentioned in the past that um, work is being done on sports teams and when sports teams can work uh, or get on the field again and how that's going to work. Wondering about swimming pools. Is there any chance that swimming pools will be able to be open this summer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know they're working on that too. Uh, that is some of the things that we've learned, that this virus doesn't transmit in, in uh, especially chlorinated or ozonated uh, water or salt water. So yes, the, the risk, of course, is people coming together around the pool and in the locker room and those things. So there will need to be measures in place to reduce numbers, to make sure that uh, um, that we're not having uh, close contact with people in the locker rooms and and I know that that's being worked on but I absolutely I mean I think that's something that we can look forward to in the coming weeks. Great. That's all the time we have thank for today. Thank you.